Hi, my name is Brett Linkletter, CEO and founder of Misfit Media, the best damn restaurant marketing agency on the planet. Here at Misfit, we help restaurant owners grow and scale their business through strategic online marketing practices. Right now, you're listening to our podcast, Restaurant Misfits, where we'll discuss all things related to restaurant marketing, management, and everything else in between growing a restaurant business. This podcast is also brought to you in collaboration with Total Food Service. For over 30 years, Total Food Service has provided the restaurant and food service industry with exclusive interviews to the latest news on products, trends, associations, and events. You can sign up for a free monthly subscription by visiting TotalFood.com today. And from all the misfits over here, we hope you enjoy the show. Cheers. What's up, guys? Brett here. And in this episode, I interview Jamie Simpson, who's the executive chef of the Culinary Vegetable Institute. Um, Jamie's got a really cool, interesting background. He actually started out as a musician, uh, and he was uh, he was on a punk rock band touring the country. Really interesting, really awesome. And now he's a chef. He's living on a farm. Uh, and at the Culinary Vegetable Institute, they're supplying vegetables for hundreds of restaurants all over the states. Um, they've also deliver. They've also created a new home delivery program, which has been thriving because of COVID, as you can imagine, right? They had to change their approach, but it's something that for that for them has been extremely profitable and something they're going to definitely keep moving forward with. Um, Jamie's a really cool guy, and we talk about a lot of interesting points as far as food sustainability, how we can be better on that, and some of the practices they use at the institute. And so, without further ado, let's dive right in. Jamie, how you doing? So good, uh, considering the circumstances. Yeah, it's great out here. Right, right. It is. It is crazy. It, something feels better about being the new year, though. I know, obviously, we're still going through all this craziness, but the new year feels fresher, feels newer for us, I guess. Right, a little bit. <laughs> for, sure. for some reason. For sure. Yeah. 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 You know. You know. We we always like living and working on a farm. We we really mark our existence really by the seasons. You know, as as spring. Uh, is shifts into summer, you know, it's not like a, you know, tomorrow is summer officially. Uh, there's always this sort of, you know, slow progress through, through the world uh, that, that we really admire. So no, I, I don't necessarily buy into like January 1st, 2021, new day, new year. Um, yes. <laughs> but it, it, it's definitely leaning in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I hear what you're saying. Um, well, tell us for everyone just listening and doesn't really know who you are. Tell us about yourself and, and really what you do. Yeah, I'm the chef liaison here uh, where we are in the dining room of the Culinary Vegetable Institute. And the Culinary Vegetable Institute is this unbelievable place that was designed by some of the greatest like pillars of our food service ecosystem, mm. which is was uh, Charlie Trotter and Thomas Keller and, and Danielle Balud and you know they got their heads together a, a bunch of chefs uh, to to build a kitchen on a farm in the middle of in the middle of the agricultural belt of America in my opinion which is New York yeah. the Midwest uh, and the farm is called the Chef's Garden. We've been growing vegetables for restaurants in 14 countries. We grow about 600 varieties of, of vegetables. And this place was really established to, to, to give people in the industry a better understanding of, of, of where their food comes from, of, of who grows it, how it's grown, and what to do with it when, uh, when you get it out of the ground. So we've got Absolutely. a kitchen here that, that really kind of, you know, suits the, those purposes really well. It's beautiful. Amazing. And how many restaurants do you guys currently serve? <laughs> Today, you know, uh, outside yeah. of Chicago and New York and Disney, um, you know, several hundred. Amazing. Amazing. And how long has it been around for? Uh, 30 years, almost 35 years. The chef's garden has existed. This place is on its 20th year anniversary this year um wow and it, you know it, it started with the, the jones family farmers many of you in this audience will definitely know farmer lee jones clad in his you know blue uh, <laughs> you know, um denim 
suspenders and a red bow tie and a white shirt. And I think, um, you know, they, they were in a more conventional farming back in the day, in the early 80s, high interest rates and a hailstorm wiped it out and forced them to reevaluate the business model as a whole. And let's look at starting over uh, a completely new direction. And at that time, there wasn't any really specialty purveyors. You, you don't look that old, and I'm certainly not, but I, I can definitely, in my youth, remember a time where you know the produce section in a grocery store was even a, a complete afterthought. Um, so they were really, uh, you know, embarking on a on a new world uh, of of unusual varieties of vegetables, and the only audience that really latched onto that were chefs and restaurants. Got it, got it. And how how do you even get into this this space? I, I actually was looking at you, you. Used to be like a musician, right? A rock musician. Yeah, for for several years in my youth, um, traveled the country in a punk band and uh, played music. And, no and way. Loved, loved, loved to travel. It was not a sustainable way of living. Um, and it, it, it was ultimately not the future for me. I cooked in a, a kitchen on the, you know during the day and worked in a great hotel and things were sort of lining up and, you know, a path that I had a little bit more control over, which was cooking. Hundred percent. No, but that's that's really cool. It, it's funny because even when I was, man, middle school, early high school, I used I used to, I used to sing in a rock band. So I, I I saw that and I was like, oh, that's that's really damn cool. Like <laughs> that's awesome. I um, think there's a lot of us. You know, I, you know, and totally. In terms of like misfits in general, um, most most cooks sort of land in the kitchen because they're accepted there, right? And they're, they're somewhat, totally. you know, can be at home with other weirdos. And um, it seems like 100%. a natural progression for musicians to, to somehow. It is weird, kitchen. right? I, it, well, you know, our company is called Misfit Media. L- literally. Yeah. The, the whole, the whole reason, right. Is, is I, I really saw myself as a misfit. Like, like you just said, you know, we're, we're all kind of misfits. We're all kind of like, we want to do things differently. And, and, uh, Hey, we're, we're both kind of in the food space. Obviously you, you a lot more than me, I'm, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a restaurant marketer. So that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's interesting how that well, goes. There down. are so many different directions. And I tell this to uh, like culinary students and like, you know, prospects, industry people all the time that like, you know, you, you can very, very well, like, you know, navigate this industry and you don't have to work in a restaurant, you know, you don't have to be a chef um, for your perspective, you know, it's just, focus entirely on like food service marketing, there's food stylists and photographers and, you know, book writers and all kinds of people in, around our world. That it's really cool. hundred percent, hundred percent. So um, tell us more about, I, I understand that you guys um, at the Culinary Vegetable Institute, it, do you guys have a, you have a, some kind of new home delivery program, right? Is that something that's happened because of the pandemic or? Yeah, right. Absolutely. You know, it just turned our business over. We thought we were diverse because we, uh, you know, we had we had restaurants in multiple countries, or we had high end and like quick service, and um, you know, hotels and stuff like that. Uh, but that, well, ultimately, was not a diverse business model. Um, and so, when every restaurant on the planet closed at once, uh, and the farm keeps farming, uh, we were left with uh, one decision, which was which yep. was find a new customer. And, and, and very rapidly, fortunately, Ohio was one of the first states to shut down restaurants. Um, we felt it first and were able to turn really quickly and by, you know, the support of chefs and the support of, of friends in the industry, um, we were able to build a, a, a pretty great market very quickly for homes. Got it. Got it. That's and, where my and, whole um, world has, has really been. Yeah. And so, and so, and so what, what is obviously like the supply chain of, of who you're serving obviously has changed a lot, but how have you guys adjusted the business in that way? What, what are some of the challenges that you had to go through to, to make that you happen? Know, we always, we always like live by the line that every part of a plant's life offers something new and unique to the plate. It's how mm. with 600 varieties of vegetables, we can produce 10,000 skews on our farm. The idea that, the, a, a little tiny cucumber, you know, 
uh, and then a little tiny cucumber with a bloom attached and then like a, a slightly larger cucumber and the leaves and the tendrils and all these parts of these plants like ultimately you know work in our favor in a more sustainable business model one of our challenges uh, really became that nobody at home wants cucumber blooms you know, like in general, uh, they do mm. and are interested in the novel idea of a couple of them, but it, it just, we had to then grow those cucumbers out to larger size or like squash blossoms became squash um, across the entire kaleidoscope of agriculture, we, you know, where we used to sell a bunch of little carrots um, to restaurants all over the world, you know, that we just grew them a little bigger and people at home could then relate to them and use them. We worked out uh, overall there was, with very little loss. And what was potential agricultural waste, we developed a, uh, you know, a, a, a basically a food production facility here where we're making like dried line of teas and, you know, it's bars of soap and vinegars and hot sauces and all kinds of stuff that would ultimately wow. have been lost. Wow. I've always thought it would be just so badass to, to open up a, a hot sauce line, like just something like that. <laughs> Is have you ever had have you ever had truff hot sauce? Have you tried that before? Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. It's no. like it's like this it's like this truffle infused hot sauce. Oh my god! It, it, I I just I sent them a message on Instagram and I said you guys are are so cool. I'd love to try it. And they sent me a full box. <laughs> it was. Nice. Isn't you guys got to try? It. I mean, it's it is incredible. If you're a hot sauce guy, oh yeah, God, not not no, yeah. no, I I don't I don't make any money by mentioning them, but they're they're legit. They're, <laughs> I love I love what they're doing. It's really good. Cool, that's am that's amazing. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's really interesting. So okay, so now with the home delivery program, that's that's obviously opened up an, a new revenue opportunity for you guys. Do you, do you see that staying sure. around for long term for you guys forever, or do you think? It's yeah, it's not it's not going point? anywhere. Right. No, we're yeah. only, you know, we're, we're looking to double it again this year. Um, and, wow. uh, and hopefully keep that, uh, keep that restaurant model alive uh, as, as well as restaurants are doing, you know, we, we, we are, we are rooting for chefs, you know, we're really in, in that, in that corner and the farm is, is ultimately supportive of, uh, yeah. of uh, you know, every uh, element of recovery for restaurant models. It's, you know, we've, we've been doing so many really fun, special projects for chefs that are just trying to hang on to. It's really cool. Amazing. No, I love that. I love that. Um, based on what you guys have seen in the food space and in the, in the restaurant industry this year, I mean, what are, what are some things that you've noticed have, have been major problems? I mean, what, other than obviously the shutdowns and this and that, but what are some of the issues you, you currently see in the restaurant space? I, I think the model overall is is just broken. You know, uh, I feel somewhat yeah. somewhat jaded and uh, you know, kind of disappointed. But some of the greatest restaurants on the planet, you know, with with awards and accolades and everything else, only have like you know ten to twelve days of cash flow without you know a regular service. And, yeah. and that makes no sense. You know, it's a financial model that's like just done. If like, let's say 95% of our income then goes back into a community, that's great. Um, but if the business isn't sustainable, then the model is broken. Um, and I, I think that I see a way there's got to be a really like creative model uh, coming around the corner that will really help the buffer restaurants in the future. Yeah. What, 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 what about the business model is not sustainable? Cause a lot of people tell me this and, and, you know, I have to agree to some, to some degree, but tell me about what, what, what is specific about the business model is broken. I mean, there's a, there's a race to the bottom in terms of, in terms of like menu prices and competitive, you know, rates, let's say I buy, you know, some product uh, and it costs me eight bucks um how much can i sell that for you know to build in enough revenue where we're actually making money you know and if yeah. i'm not able to generate enough revenue from that because of the other costs of, of of you know these damn linens um you know 
centerpieces, uh, cleaning floors, obviously labor. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's not enough. You know, I think that, I think that people aren't actually paying the, the true price of food, you know, and the, the, the lives, you know, that require to, to put it together. Farmers as a result are struggling too, you know, so, so farmers have to, you know, do more for less. You know what I mean? There was a secretary of agriculture, Earl Butts, uh, who most famously said, this is in like the seventies, he said, get big or get out. Right. And what yeah. that meant was, you know, that the farmers had to produce more, you know, that get more land and make more food and do it for less uh, or just get out of farming. And that has really crippled our, you know, our sustainability. Yeah. You know, it's like, what, why, it, why should a, a, a turnip cost nothing? You know, why should, why are we expected to pay like very little for, for food, you know, and then the, it happens at the grocery stores even. It's why this farm is not involved in grocery stores is because the, the model is just a, like a, you know, a mosh pit for, for beating up farmers. Yeah. It is kind of crazy. Like you said, like, why, why should we, why are we expected to pay nothing for food? Like, but you're totally right. I mean, it's, if, you, if you look at like what's what's happened over the years um, with, with a number of things, right? Let's just say the way the economy is going, the way that the minimum wage has gone up, uh, some of the inflation, but then the food cost isn't going up a whole lot, right? So the margins are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, I mean, how, you know, how do we combat this? I mean, what, what, do you have any kind of ideas? I mean, maybe, maybe it's, is it an educational thing for the customer base? Because you're totally right, right? It's like I hear our clients say it all the time. They're like, Brad, if, if I if I just increase my prices by like a dollar, sometimes even fifty cents, the 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 uproar from the customer base is is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like I they're like our hands I mean, are tied. I don't know what to do. My girlfriend partner Morgan Tucker and I also own uh, two coffee shops in town. And nice. You, know, you, you don't mess with someone's coffee, right? One thing I've learned is <laughs> yeah. You, know, you, you, you you can't raise even 10 cents, you know, you can't touch it. So we've got to find ways outside of that in the periphery to, to, to bring up check averages. And that model works for restaurants as well. You're seeing it with, um, you know, basically like, like grocery stores, essentially like markets. So like you go in, you can buy like, you know, uh, a meal, uh, but exit through the gift shop, you know, and pick up like mise en place along the way. Um, Food waste is a is a really really fun way to look at you know additional revenue models of, of byproducts essentially that get tossed. How do you turn that into uh, something else, something shelf stable that can also be purchased? Fermentation is a is a is a really fun way to look at buying things at a at a low cost, uh, building a, a lot of it and serving it over time, which is really really good. I don't know if there's one answer. I think I think it, you got to look at the, the cost of you know new equipment. You got to look at allowing technology to do some of your heavy lifting in the kitchen yeah. space. There's so many manufacturers out there that are making equipment to do the heavy lifting. Really, um, yeah. So you know that that helps support some of that labor cost situation. It's a it's a tricky one. Yeah. And that's the thing I've noticed too, especially because of, because of COVID and everything that's been going on is, is, you know, people, people knew the restaurant model, the business model was, was somewhat broken, of course, but I think the pandemic made it, everyone realize it even more, right? Wow. We really have way too many employees. Wow. We really are paying for way too many things. Uh, we definitely are way too cheap. Um, what the heck? <laughs> we got to fix this, right? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this for some of our clients that have done some of the things like in store where like, you know, you're scanning a QR code and maybe you're ordering through a QR code versus even a server now. Now that maybe they had four servers, now they only have two because there's there's less people having to take orders because now people are ordering with technology. Now, you know, that that's sad for those employees that are now unemployed, right? But unfortunately, because, you know, we can't drive up food costs and everyone freaks out, this is what's happening. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, I think, I think uh, vegetables are an important part of the future. 
you know, you look at those items and vegetables yeah. in general, they're, 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 they cost less per pound than like, a, you know, a, some great beef or chicken or anything, anything really, they cost, they cost less. Uh, and so you're able to really do a lot more versus, you know, with like really fun, versatile, easy techniques. Um, you're not, you're not like competing against your own menu prices because you're not raising prices on existing menu items. You're, you're creating new menu items and you can bring the price up on those, you know, even comparable yeah. to the other, other dishes. And so now if I'm getting, you know, 13 bucks for a, a, a chicken pot pie, uh, and I've just added another $13 carrot pot roast, you know, next to it on the menu. And, you know, the cost difference is, is, is pretty great. Yeah. Um, so the, the margins are then grown on that, on that item. 100%. Jamie, what are, what are some of the sustainable practices that you guys practice at the Colony Vegetable Institute? We have a, we have a crazy little system. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're not a restaurant. We're not a restaurant. We're only open to the public, you know, maybe once a month. Uh, we do private yeah. dinners all the time and we do lots of video shoots and stuff like that. But because of our basic business model, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a huge potential for, for waste, right? Like if I if I bring in yeah. ingredients for a single thing, and you don't have another single thing in a couple of days, um, you know, we, we really looked at building a little ecosystem of ingredients. So one of our biggest ways was first by kind of slowly weeding out uh, all of our purveyors. Um, we still have some. We still rely on on some for basic pantry staples, but we let the farm write our menus. You know, we harvest only what we need. Um, we cook what we need, or we take advantage of the season when it's giving us things in abundance. You know, that yep. abundance then makes its way into a root cellar, you know, like your grandmother's, you know, the old fashioned way of canning and larding and drying and fermenting and jarring yeah. stuff that stuff then works its way back into the cycle when needed. Yeah. Um, in, any overage from that of trim, you know, peels, things like that, that goes to like the chickens, right? And then the chickens lend back uh, eggs, which is really great. For many years when we had a lot of events, we had a herd of heritage pigs on property. And those pigs Got were it. a great outlet for overage and they would turn themselves magically into ham every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. I, I love how you illustrated that. <laughs> That's amazing. No, no, that is, that is amazing. Um, it, is, it seems like right now, I, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm a restaurant marketer. I'm not a restaurant tour, right? But, but from what I've heard from our clients, and I think I've seen from you guys is, you know, what, what I've seen you guys talk about online is it just seems like there's an enormous amount of waste in general in the, in the States, right? overall yeah it's by it, 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 it seems like it's by design too it's it's part of this part of the system and like you know it's, it's illegal to make hot sauce you know the, the proper way um it's it's in, in in many outlets it's it's illegal for them to say you know dry something you know and i think that's that's really sad you know without like you have to have this constant cold chain distribution, you know, you're, 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 you know, say you, you put a bunch of fruit out on a buffet and, you know, in that model, it's just garbage. It, it, it will not come back into the kitchen. Uh, it makes no sense. The, we did a project with Marriott last year and Marriott, um, basically their largest waste item was like, was fruit from breakfast buffets. Wow. That's a lot, you know, that's a lot. Because they're just doing breakfast buffets, putting fruit, fruit out and then it just goes to waste. Yeah, it has to right. be in abundance. It has to look like, you know, bountiful and like, you know, consumable. <laughs> yeah. Delicious. Oh. So like you're the last guy in line and the buffet still looks great. Got it, you know? got it. Interesting. No, I mean, it, it, you're, you're totally right. We, we do, it's like you said, we're kind of wasteful by design. It's kind of like the American way. Everything's everything's bigger, <laughs> more food. I mean, um, 
I and I, I got I got a lot of friends or, or foreigners, and when they're first time coming to the states, all they can say is, "Oh my god, there's just everything you order. There's so much food. It's this is crazy." Yeah. And then, and then, and then we wonder why everyone's overweight too. Everyone Americans always think, "I, I gotta I gotta finish my plate." <laughs> no, if you're hungry, stop eating. <laughs> first of all. <laughs> If you're not hungry, stop eating. It's, Just stop. <laughs> that's, a, that's another thing is like, yeah, presenting some more realistic portion sizes. But I think restaurants in general are sort of picking up on that. Um, you know, there's, there's still yeah. a few places that are just obsessive and uh, excessive and absurd. Uh, but yeah. I think in general as a, as a category, we're, we're sort of figuring that out. And Jamie, you said earlier that you guys, uh, you're doing a lot of filming on the farm. You're doing a lot of online kind of stuff. Tell me about that. What, what, what is it? Is it a, for marketing purposes? Is it, you have kind of a fan base that watches your guys' stuff? Tell me more about that, the content you guys are producing. Well, you know, we always had a, an in-house video team, photography team, you know, marketing team. We've, we've always needed to educate a customer uh, on the products that we use in history that was that was chefs those were you know this this new rare variety of, of uh, tuber from peru is is now available what do you do with it so our role at that point was to like you know develop some content around it give some context to chefs and our sales team and help them sort of make sense of it all got it uh, today it's it's really been on home cooks you know where we're, we're looking at purple cauliflower, I mean, you know, it's, e it's easy enough for a chef to wrap his head around purple cauliflower, but for home cooks, it's a different animal. And uh, so we're just making new content. Uh, we also just recorded a pilot episode for a new series that we're looking to produce on vegetables. No way. Um, that last, last week. Um, and that has been underwritten by one of our equipment manufacturers, Waring, who's, who's really interested in telling stories about food waste and, and sustainable agriculture and sustainable living and things like that. That uh, is so amazing. I'd say we just spent the last 18 months working on a cookbook um, for home cooks. It's a 700 wow. page vegetable guide. Uh, we're, we're really excited for that. Uh, and it is now available. We haven't announced it yet. You're actually the first guy to know. It's available for order on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Oh, amazing! We'll have to get a copy. That is so cool, man. I love that. I lost your audio here. That is so cool. You lost my audio. I can no, I got no longer you. hear you. Um. Let's see. You can't hear me? I, I, can, I can hear can you. Can you hear Jamie. me? I can hear you. Yeah. I got nothing. Is it in your headphones, maybe? Check. Can you hear me now? Hello, hello. My microphone is still on. Should be. I can hear you. I can't uh, hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Or oh, no? I can't hear you. Damn. <laughs> oh, God. Um, let's see. Get into. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Got that. Great. Hello, you can hear me? Oh, perfect. Okay. So weird. I don't know what happened there. Um, all right. Well, got you now. Uh, <laughs> what's that? On book. Yeah, on the book. Yes, back uh, to the book. So you said you launched the book. It just went, it just went live on Amazon. That's right. Uh, the book is, is, is now available. We, I think we're probably going to announce it in about a month. It, it, it releases uh, mid-April. Uh, mid 
and it's a it's a monster project um, and, and it has been sure. a, a big part of our day to day here for the last two years. So we're excited for that. Um, and that'll be a, just a great uh, resource for both chefs and home cooks, you know, if people to get a better understanding of vegetables, where their food comes from, what to do with them. Uh, so there's a ton of recipes in it. We're really excited about it. That's amazing. I'll check it out for sure. That's amazing, man. So that was so awesome. Um, what else do you guys use that content for? You said you said it's for also for your marketing and sales team. Do they do they use that content uh, in the marketing pieces? I'm assuming for you guys. Yeah, hundred right? percent. I mean, yeah. If, even if we dinner here, we do these uh, vegetable showcase dinners, and it might be five or six courses of a single ingredient. Um, we'll do a photo shoot on those dinners uh, for guests. Nice. But the shoot, those photos then work their way into the chef's garden marketing component. Yeah. Very, very cool. And then question for you in, in general, Jamie, it seems like, you know, kind of like yourself, you, you have kind of your own, obviously, personal brand that you, you've obviously attached to the Culinary Institute. Has that been a pretty instrumental thing, I think, for, for the business overall? I don't know. You know, we, it's hard to measure marketing and maybe you're better at it than, than I am, but um, <laughs> yeah. the efforts of a, of a podcast like this, you know, what what ultimately does it, does it do? Now, I do a lot of these uh, kinds of conversations and, you know, we're, we, we love to do them, um, but you never really know and how to pinpoint, you know, where the success was. And you know, mm. we have a pretty good idea, um, but we never really know for sure. And that's, that's probably, you know, a, a fault of our own. Um, but yeah, we've, we've definitely built a brand around vegetables, you know, and 100%. really have, 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 continue to be somewhat of an authoritative voice on, on produce, you know, and how, how to deal with it and, and how to make sense of it and, you know, how to inspire with it. And I think that's really fun. That's a new category. Chefs in 100%. general, they spend time on like the perfect sous vide, like short rib and the, the, the perfect like sauce for it. And, and then the, you know, the, the, the onions or something that they serve with it is a sort of a, after well, tell, well, tell me, tell me this. I want to do something that I, I actually don't typically do on a podcast, but I'm kind of curious. So tell me about your guys' marketing to sales process. You know, how you go about, let's say, acquiring a new restaurant to work with and supply vegetables for. How does that process typically go? Um, we, have a, uh, we have a group of, of people in the, on the farm, and that group of people is, is, is all about, their, we call it the product specialists. Uh, it's a relationship business. You know, the farm has never paid a dollar for advertising for, for ma me, you know, magazine, digital print, yeah. whatever. They don't, they don't pay for advertising. And that's, you know, a, probably difficult for a guy like you to get behind. Um, you know, no, but I think it's interesting, you know, that, because it's a testament relationships in general. Um, so chefs move yeah. around a lot, you know, our product specialists really kind of live and land with, with those people. They exist with them and we go from restaurant to restaurant with them. One person is one relationship and they're, you know, they really, really, you know, become good friends with, with the people they work with. Got it. Um, for, for new, you know, for new restaurants, you know, that we don't do a lot of real active marketing to, you know, new to build new relationships. And I think that's one of our current, you know, goals and projects right now is, is getting a better understanding of, you know, it's a big world out there and, and we're kind of in a small little bubble of it or part of it. Well, it's, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this what you guys are currently doing, obviously you guys business, you have been in business for over 30 years. So obviously you guys have built some kind of status. You guys have built a reputation and that's obviously been leading you guys. And is it obviously the reason for your success today, right? Which is fantastic for you guys. All I can say though, is the opportunities in marketing and advertising as obviously I have a bias towards it. That's I run an ad agency, <laughs> but it's, it's what I tell people is, is this it's, it's, if, if your business has grown through word of mouth, which it sounds like it has reputation, the success you've seen, the relationships, 
all marketing and advertising can do is help accelerate the success you're already seeing. Yeah, I, I, I say it's like it's an it's a truth accelerator. If you guys are already killing it. All this is going to do is help you accelerate the success you're already seeing. Plain and simple, that's how it works, right? Now, you know, I'll tell you for me, right? <clears throat> the the first the first year we broke a million dollars in sales, I went from three to thirteen. So I went from three to twelve employees that year, and it was because I really figured out my own marketing system for my internal marketing, right? Being able to run ads profitably to acquire customers profitably and and then work with them and then keep them right because we're doing a good job but you know i i I would say you know whoever's on the marketing team for you guys that's something definitely look into because you guys you know from what i can see online and from what we talked about today you you guys are absolutely killing it there's no doubt (laughs) you guys are awesome now we just need more people to know about you guys that's all you know yeah that's that's kind of what we're after that's that's what we want to do we want to it's cool we're, we're talking to the same little ecosystem. We need to get outside of that and grow the, you know, the overall awareness. And as soon as like, I think as long as you know about this place and you and you get into it, you, you'll love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it's one of those, you know, it's one of those interesting, uh, interesting things in the world. Um, we do, um, you know, I, I would look at, let's say, let's look at this as like a, like a, starting with a product because that's really where, where my la- my life is right like yeah there's a new you know variety of, of sweet potato that we've developed with Louisiana State University and it, and it's completely white and it tastes like uh, it tastes like vanilla ice cream or something right yep. so like we first identify that item um, we would then you know put it in production and figure out yield. Uh, output and then overall like you know success of, of growth if it's a green light then it comes here to the institute and we get to do some like culinary like you know exploration with this thing try and find new applications for it or really interesting delicious you know things to do with it that information goes to both marketing and sales sales takes that information to um, you know share it with their people and marketing takes that information to, you know, get it on the website and get it, you know, get it, get everything else packaged around it. That's important. hundred um, percent. And it's a really cool process from that perspective. Really beautiful. Wow. Um, sort of collection of, of farmers and, you know, photographers and chefs and, you know, people that are passionate about vegetables and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a cool thing how it all, how it comes together. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm I'm assuming you guys probably have a pretty massive like database of, of emails and a community of some sort, right? That you guys have collected. Yeah, the team, the marketing team has done a really great job of maintaining relationships digitally as well. Yeah, they, they have a good, yeah, uh, really nice little system going. Hundred percent. And then the last thing I I saw Jamie with you is I I saw on your Instagram you've uh you hold the world's record, the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest dinner party. Actually, it's um, this Tuesday, so you know. Oh, it's going to be this Tuesday. In, yeah, it's coming up. It's an attempt, so we, we just um, we just released the the link and stuff to it. But this next uh, this next week, we're gonna put together the world's largest virtual dinner party. Wow! It's just this Tuesday coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. Sign up the oh link. Oh my god! All you have to do is um, is tune in. You don't have to like buy a. a a box from us you don't have to buy anything really just like have dinner in front of your your computer and prove that you were there it's pretty pretty straightforward and uh, yeah it's gonna be really fun we've done so many of these like um you know like cook along videos and like these live cooking things and we've done these like workshops and stuff and i'm excited about this one because it's just like you know like find, like just unplug and like tune in and hang out and we've got an hour of entertainment with some of our partners sponsors um australian yeah. beef and lamb the aussie beef and lamb is all about sustainable agriculture as well so there's a good partnership there we've got uh, nice chefs and tiktok stars and instagram legends. oh this is amazing yeah it's what is cool. it, that this is so cool. Okay, I'm definitely going to tune to this. What we'll do also, man, and I would love to do this for you guys, is we got a pretty massive email list. 
uh, of restaurant tours and, and people just interested in the food space. We're going to do a blast for you guys on this. Awesome. This should be, <laughs> <laughs> this should, yeah. I love this. Yeah. It's a fun thing to participate in. And like anybody, like anywhere that wants to like tune in can help break a world record. You know, how, how fun. Damn. You said, okay. And it's, it's, it's funny. Cause you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned, okay. You said, you said Australian, meat farmers are you said that if they're a lot more sustainable than americans in general is that you're saying yeah 100 yeah, yeah, percent. i mean australia's government as a whole puts a lot of you know or it's a very different dynamic so in u.s like you're incentivized to you know get big or get out like i said yeah you grow more you grow, you grow it you got to do it for less and great um but australia you're as a farmer you're incentivized for doing it right you know do it properly yeah. like have have the right amount of cattle per per land mass they're they're shooting for like carbon zero uh livestock production in australia you know, and it's, that's it's funny you mention this because so my my girlfriend's australian and she always gives us shit saying you know we actually have better burgers in australia than you guys do in the states and i was like what come on that's that's our thing you know yeah. i don't you know, they put um what do they put, who knows they put on there. <laughs> they put, yeah they do i was in australia last year it's beets it makes no sense <laughs> yeah it, it is weird i mean i haven't i haven't been in australia so i i guess I'll, I'll probably be going at some point maybe later this year and we'll see i know that with covid there's a lot of restrictions so we'll see i'll i'll, I'll get i'll get my two cents um last thing you just mentioned which was kind of interesting to me because a lot of restaurants have been asking me about it is is tiktok uh do you do you guys see tiktok as as a marketing channel for you guys potentially or are you are you on tiktok no, I'm not. But potentially, I mean, like with, with taking existing content and sort of repackaging it for a different, you know, I, I don't necessarily right now at this point see that the TikTok audience is our customer. Um, yeah. But, but I um, but I do see that there's a lot of like, you know, value in the, in the sense of marketing to, a, you know, a, a new audience. Uh, totally. Yeah. I, it's not out of the question by any means. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I got on it probably a few months ago. Again, I think I have to agree with you. It, it is a younger audience, but so was Instagram early days. And, and you know, even Facebook yeah. started with college kids. So right. I don't know. might be kind of interesting. Maybe somebody to consider because a lot of my clients have been asking, can we start doing this? Oh, well, not there yet, but I'm looking into it for you guys. So <laughs> anyway, um, Jamie, this has been really cool then, man. It's, it's been awesome getting to know you and, and more about what you guys do. If anyone's listening or, or watching this and, and they want to learn more about you and the Institute, how, how do they do so? You know, you know we, st we stick to all sorts of channels. Our, our, our most active, um, you know, place is, is social media. You know, that, that kind of gives us, you know, a day-to-day -day sort of window into the world of what the CCCVI is working on. You know, whether it's virtual workshops or online cooking classes or trying to break a world record um our social media channels are really the the direction to to kind of follow up if it's more like you know you know vegetables at home you're after you know just check out our websites any of them we have yeah the chef's garden farmer jones farm is that home delivery segment and then culinary vegetable institute and, you know, we've got a lot of fun projects in the pipe, uh, really excited about this book launch. Uh, and once yeah. all that's sort of, sort of rolling, hopefully we'll, you know, we're, we're pretty lined up for a great year. Hell yeah. And then, oh yeah, one more thing I just remember that popped in my mind is you guys said you're doing a lot of live content too. Has that been pretty cool for you guys overall? Uh, it's been, it's been tough. You know, we, 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 we tried it a couple ways. We, we do um, pre-recorded content you know, that we then stream live to a live audience and then do some like post Q and A. Uh, and we're doing a lot of just like, you know, you know, ad hoc sort of like grab a, grab a camera and let's like walk through the garden real quick. Totally. Uh, and the value I think in them for us, we've seen is just like being, they, you know, they, they don't disappear. So when these videos are done, they, they, they still exist. And so we yep. may not have like, you know, 700 chefs on at once like actively asking questions and stuff like that but then you do end up getting the views and you know response from it uh over time and i think that's that's pretty good i like them too because they're not as um you know there's not as much of a production on our end you know we just yeah. really want 
walk through the garden. We've got a couple people like lined up and like this guy's going to pull some carrots. He wants to talk about them. Let's head over to the cauliflower and this, you know, check yes. out the tomato house, right? You know, and that stuff's fun. It's, I think it's really cool what, what uh, some of those things have. have it is cool. I mean, it's, it's, I, I like that you guys are, you, it sounds like you've experimented a lot of different things. Live is another thing for us as an agency that, you know, I, I think honestly is something that more people need more of is that's how you connect with people, right? If you're seeing someone live doing something that that is, that's how you really, really, really connect with someone, build a community and build that relationship to hopefully work together. Right. So anyway, man, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, you know, we're grateful for total food service. Grateful for you. We're grateful for, you know, Morgan Tucker who, who lined this up. And um, it'll be, you know, fun to see it. Absolutely, man. So this will probably go live in the next couple of weeks, or like, sorry, le probably less than a week actually. Um, looking forward to it, man. Again, uh, we'll we'll be in touch. But thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, thank man. you. Chat soon then. See you, Jamie.